As highlighted in both Brown readings you did for the first two units, medical sociologists use social constructionist theory to interpret the social experience of illness. But what does the social constructionist perspective emphasize? Social constructionism is a key perspective in sociology that emphasizes the ways in which social institutions, norms, attitude, values, behavior, and beliefs are socially produced rather than naturally given or determined. It is concerned with the meaning, and I want to highlight this, that is attached to diagnosis, illness, and disease. A social constructionist approach pays attention also to the role that structures play in health and illness, such as those of race, class, gender, as well as professional and institutional factors. A strong social constructionist approach questions the natural or biological basis for almost all social phenomena. Phil Brown, in the reading for today, argues that for medical sociology to understand the role of diagnosis and illness, it must join together with so social causation theory, meaning examining the conditions that cause an illness or disease. It is defined as the origins of illness that result from social conditions or social interactions. And, the social, of course, the social constructionist approach, which focuses both on social forces, but more so on the meaning attached to diagnosis, illness, health, and disease. Social constructionism holds that individuals and groups produce their own conceptions of reality, and that knowledge itself is a product of social dynamics. It is a perspective that is particularly problematic when we begin to discuss sexuality, consciousness, body, disease, and human emotions. And this is so because our reality, our social reality, um, often appears to us to be determined by bodies, diseases, or the natural world. Sociologists argue that we are socialized into certain patterns of behavior, Hence, sexuality and gender difference, illness, health, and physical strengths are also social states and codes which are products of culture and not so much biology. There is a distinction between the medical notion of disease and the social constructionist concept of uh, disease and illness. Medical sociologists use social constructionist perspective to interpret the social experience of illness. For the medical profession, disease is a biomedical condition universal and unchanging, even though to some extent shaped by social forces. Whereas social construction is defined illness as the social meaning of that condition. The distribution of disease differs on the basis of social factors like gender, race, class, and others. Illness then reflects a more subjective phenomenon. It holds a diverse range of connotations and there's no consensus over its meaning. It is important to note also that to understand its meaning and its implications on health and disease, it is important, like any good sociologist, to explore illness in its wider context in relation to health policy, differences between professionals and lay people's view of health, and society in general. Some illnesses are particularly embedded with cultural meaning, which is not directly derived from the nature of the condition, and this shapes how society responds to those afflicted and influenced by the experience of that illness. All illnesses are socially constructed at the experiential level, based on how individuals come to understand and live with their illnesses. Medical knowledge about the illness and disease is not necessarily given by nature, but is constructed and developed by claim makers and interested parties. The culture of a society constructs also the way members think and feel about sickness and health. For example, we are taught about different sicknesses and their names, their characteristic symptoms and courses, their causes and mitigating circumstances, their cosmological and moral significance, and appropriate responses. As a culture immersed in an era of medical technology, we look at illness often as an, entire, an entirely biological process. Disease is often defined by what medicine says is happening to the body. For example, cancer is cancer. There's nothing anyone um, in our society can say to change the meaning of that. It is pure biology. In reality, though, ideas about health and illness are also social constructions. While science is a major contributor, society's non-scientific beliefs regarding anything from health and illness to mor uh, morality also have an enormous impact on the development of diseases. So, disease is not only that underlying biology, but also a set of words, concepts, values embedded in a cultural, social, and political context. Disease is a concept we have in the West that expresses our concern with the underlying core physical condition. In what way can something true that is real, so quote-unquote out there, something that is caused by an agent like a microbe, be spoken of as a social construction? 
There's only subjective experience of illness, which is determined by the social, cultural, historical, and geographical context which we inhabit. So all contexts, uh, concepts, excuse me, either professional, academic, or lay, are also culturally and historically specific in that they vary from culture to culture and across time. For example, obesity is a sign of ill health and socially undesirable in Western culture, but in non-Western culture, it is considered a sign of affluence and thus socially desirable. Or take the case of epilepsy, which in the Middle Ages was viewed as a violent possession by a malevolent or even divine forces. In ancient Greece, it was viewed as a condition in which there was a blockage of veins in the head due to an excess of phlegm. In the early part of the 20th century, epilepsy was linked to insanity. Today, we know that epilepsy is caused by abnormal neurological activity that occurs as a result of a damage or injury to the brain. However, what we know is subject to reinterpretation. At any moment, new technological advances, new medical discoveries, new ways of looking at the structure and functioning of the body or the brain could replace the current orthodoxy, and epilepsy could be seen in a totally different light. Thus, our ideas about the human body are also social constructs, and this is a very key important idea in medical sociology. This is because cultural beliefs, practices, shape the way in which the body is perceived. And here I want to offer a couple of um, examples. The first would be foot binding in China, where cultural beliefs about what the body should look like directly affect the biological makeup of a people, in this case, women. Illness, then, is not simply a biological experience, but also a social one. Just as women's bodies, bodies in China are literally altered and shaped by society, our cultural values influence what we consider to be healthy as well as what we consider to be sick. Another example of how the definition of disease can be influenced by social factors is the historical case of masturbation. While it is still an uncomfortable topic in many ways in the United States today, as a whole, our society sees masturbation as more of a natural and biological encouraged practice than it did prior to the 20th century. Yet this was not always the case. In the 19th century, masturbation was actually considered a disease all of its own. It was a medically defined disease called onanism and was also referred to as self-abuse or self-pollution. It was also said to cause impotence, epilepsy, blurred vision, headaches, rheumatism, mental disorders, and much more. It emerged as an epidemic, especially among uh, young children. This forms the core around which the modern child becomes engulfed in what might be termed the sexualization of modern society. A medical and moral campaign was waged around the sexuality of children. Parents, educators, doctors were all alerted to hunt out any traces of a child's sexuality through a myriad of surveillance techniques. And upon discovery, subject, um, usually him, to a seemingly inexhaustible array of corrective measures. One 19th century doctor even invented a device which administered electric shocks to a sleeping boy's penis upon erection. As medicine progressed, then the symptoms were seen to be false, and simultaneously our culture transitioned into an era of much more relaxed views about sexuality. The third example that I want to think about, and um, it's also included in the recommended reading, and something you may want to take up as a possible research project, is kleptomania or shoplifting, which in the 19th century became the subject of medical concern and popular public interest. Kleptomania, as the recommended reading argues, was, became a quasi-medical term that conjured up images of middle-class women taking merchandise from large department stores without paying. Instead of being understood as a form of crime, it became interpreted as an illness, mainly found among middle-class women. Newspaper accounts of the time portrayed the women as suffering from this disease considered at the time a mania. For example, even the American Journal of Insanity dedicated extensive time to attempting to understand kleptomania as a form of a mental disease. While to us this may be horrific and to some extent amusing, kleptomania as a disease was explained using science and medical models of the day, as well as ideas about the role of women in Victorian society, that of being inferior to men and generally mentally unstable. And this was largely due to the weakness attached to women's sexuality. And even though kleptomania was not gender specific in a sense, it was immediately associated with women, especially their reproductive economy, which un was understood to be the seat of disorder. Because um, 19th century, women were really 
assumed to be ruled completely by biology. So kleptomania was also constructed upon the concept of class. Only middle class women seemed to suffer from this disease, whereas other members of um, social classes stole, especially the poor, it was simply considered theft. As we can see, religious, political, social, economic values can influence something that seems as scientific as a definition of disease. The combination of changes in medical technology and societal constructs that redefine this issue and the many diseases that went along with it. So what is the relationship between social construction and diagnosis of illness? This is really at the heart of the reading for unit number two. Brown begins an exposition on social construction and then considers what this means for diagnosing illness. He then introduces a revised model that takes into account constructionism and the effect of social structure on diagnosis of illness. Diagnosis, as Brown argues, is central to the work of all medical professionals because it reveals the difference between disease and illness, process and category. There are four important points that I want to make here about the role of diagnosis in medical sociology. The first is that diagnosis is important because it labels a phenomenon or a set of symptoms. Thus, as Brown argues, it can be a tool of social control. An example of this would be the medical labeling of homosexuality as a mental illness. Homosexuality existed in the DSM books well into 1973 until um, activists and different organizations fought for homosexuality to not be seen as a mental illness. The second is that diagnosis is also a contentious category. For example, how do we diagnose alcoholism as a disease? Do we say it's a disease? Do we say it's an addiction? What are the meanings we attach to an illness once we diagnose it? Thirdly, for some social group, diagnosis can help legitimate their su suffering. An example of this is post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Victims of violence can benefit from a diagnosis of PTSD because it takes away blame from the victim and takes a more social view of the problem. Um, similarly, if alcoholism is seen as a disease, how would we see, uh, for example, a drunk driver that kills someone under the influence of alcohol if he or she were to be an alcoholic, right? So it really, it can either legitimate the suffering of social groups or it could um, stigmatize them. Lastly, diagnosis serves as a pathway into the history of medical knowledge and practice. For example, we can see how diagnosis of disease has changed throughout history. We can look up textbooks of medicine, um, regulatory principles, and even political legislation, which has given names and meanings to conditions. And we saw this with the example of kleptomania. This is important to examine in terms of how public understanding of disease and illness has historically changed. In conclusion, the social construction of diagnosis, illness, and disease thus explores how various social forces are responsible for modeling our understanding and action towards illness, health, and healing. I want to wrap up this unit by stating that it's very quite possible to believe that the biomedical model is important while still emphasizing social forces as well as people's interactive decision making. And this last sentence really sums up the point made by Brown in both units one and two of the readings. So with that said, um, I will see you next time.